and welcoming those on uh, live stream with us also. I'm very grateful that we have uh, a number of times when we assemble together around the Word of God. There's a there's a lot of Christian assemblies that aren't around the Word of God, and uh, I'm grateful that we have several of these. Amen. This will be our 69th exposition of the book of Genesis. We're in chapter 43. We're going to be reviewing the first 15 verses. Now, there's a lot we have to note here tonight. A lot of very key principles that are introduced. Kingdom manners. You might call them kingdom manners. They're not commonly known. It's, it's tragic that a person has to acknowledge that, but... They're not commonly known, but you'll recognize them when we talk about them. Genesis 43, the first 15 verses. And the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt. Their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. Judah spake unto him, saying, the man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, He shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother? And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words, Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will rise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. And their father Israel said unto him, If it must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruits of the land in your vessels. Carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again in your hand. Peradventure it was on oversight. Take also your brother and rise, go again unto this man, the man, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. There's a lot of things you can see there. Right away you can see Jacob was a patriarch, but... His brothers didn't bow to him just because of that. As some people wouldn't have settled for this. They said, this is my house, you're going to do like I said. See? So you begin to see that there are responsibilities that are set in place that they don't apply under all circumstances. There's sometimes a protocol is placed to the side. Yes, be a special time. Now we're seeing in this record through Genesis, and I want to 
draw attention to some of these things as we go along. Something of the, of the sovereign God and human involvement. Now, throughout history, historically, Christianity has had a hard time diagnosing these two things. Sovereignty of God and human involvement. And some of they take sides and it's all sovereignty of God, the others all human human involvement. They're not able to put it together, and it, this controversy still rages. It's a very serious controversy. Some churches deal so little with the Scriptures, they never touch upon this, see, because they're not Bible people. But this is a hot issue, and has, from, has been for many hundreds of years. How far does God go? Is God really overall? Does he make things happen? Does he change people's minds? Does he interfere with human will? And you see people debate back and forth. But we're, we're given some incidents in Scripture of the actual workings of God, so we don't have to Amen. speculate about this. Now, when you approach a subject like this and you're trying to kind of bring the things together, there's several ways you can do this. One is you can just read everything the scriptures have to say in the subject and draw your own conclusion. And that's generally what's recommended by people that don't know very much. I don't know very many people that have actually read everything the scripture has said on any subject. I could almost count. On uh, my two hands, the people I personally know who have read everything they conceive the Bible has said on a subject. <laughs> this, is, this is just not common. So it's just largely talk when people say this. Another is to accept a traditional view of preference, and then you don't have to do any research at all. You just accept that. The other is expose your minds to what God said on these subjects. But in addition, consider how God has worked with people, and it's this latter that I recommend and that I pursue. I want to know everything God said on the subject. I want to know His reaction under these conditions. What is God? What is the revealed purpose of God? I want. I would like to think of it in that kind. What's God doing Amen. in the earth? Why is there an earth? Why are there people? What is God doing? As we come into it. And what is the perceived association between divine activity and human involvement? Is it just two different things that never come together? I tried to depict this in a, a little graphic here of the sovereignty of God. Everything revolves around his purpose. Now that, that, first of all, it's got to be clear in your mind. Everything in this world, whether it's perceived this way or not, revolves around God's purpose. Amen. And in this purpose, there's the involvement of accepted people and the involvement of unaccepted people. And God puts it all together. Amen. All of this can be seen in the book of Genesis thus far. Now, I take uh, several people that got, with whom God was involved and show the different things that they did while involved with God. Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And I'll just go over Joseph just as an example. Now, God involved himself with Joseph, and all of a sudden Joseph's doing a, a lot of things. God's doing a lot of things. I'm trying. What I'm showing here is there is no such thing as a salvation from God in which the saved ones are not regularly and intimately involved. Amen. And people who say there is just do not know what they're talking about, and that's the end of the discussion. You shouldn't listen to them. You shouldn't read them. You shouldn't fraternize with them on subjects like this. I'm just going to take Joseph. Now, God, we have in Scripture, God sent Joseph to Egypt. Now, I'm going to show all the things that were involved in that God sending him. Until he was 17, his life was incidental. Until Adam was 130, his life was incidental. 
Until Abraham was 70, his life was incidental. Until Noah was 480, his life was incidental. And you find, first of all, that your life doesn't amount to anything until God's involved with it. Amen. It's just like it didn't exist. Yes. Uh -huh. So his first 17 years incidental, he had to endure the hatred of his brothers. Now, see, this is someone God chose now. His brothers sold him into slavery. He was required to manage, he was required to manage Potiphar's house. Well, people, I know people that have households of four or five people and, and they can't, and the parents together can't manage them. And we've got to speak frankly about these things. They can't manage their house. Pa, Joseph, when he's 17, he managed Potiphar's house. The whole thing. See, God touched it. I'm showing you, he come involved. He had to confront and resist the approaches of Potiphar's wife. That was kind of a sticky situation. He had to go. He had to handle himself in that situation. He didn't have some accountability partners. He didn't have people he could call up and consult with. He's like it. He's the. He, he's it. He had to go through this by himself, and he did. He was incarcerated because of a false charge and all the feelings and everything that are connected with something like that. He had to, this is someone God chose now. He became responsible for the prisoners. I mean, these were not the best of society, you know. He became responsible for them. He interpreted the dreams of the baker and the butler, and he did so kind of on the fly, so to speak. This is all explained as God sending him down into Egypt. Yes. <laughs> but this is what was involved. Mm -hmm. So see, there are people God has sent to preach. Mm -hmm. And you take someone like Paul, all the things he went through, mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. yeah. All he lists are out there in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 6, tells all the things he went through, and he was sent to the Gentiles, but... Look all he look all that involved. Yeah, uh -huh. Joseph had to distribute had to administrate the gathering and the distribution of grain, a fourteen year project. Uh -huh. God was with Joseph and blessed him in all his circumstances. Now that's just one of the, one of the examples uh -huh. of God put His hand on somebody, uh -huh. and all of the things that that person was called to endure and over which he was. He was placed in charge, and abuse he had to take. And so, if you think if God's for us, who can be against us? Doesn't mean nothing bad ever happens. Yeah, that's right, yeah. It doesn't mean you don't have responsibilities that are mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. That isn't what it means. And if you're ever tempted to think it means you're you're off, yes. you're off course. Some of the hardships you endure may be because God called you. Some of the challenges you face and you wonder why this happened to me and I don't know if I can handle this. This may be what's happened because you're going to be used by God. See, that's, what, that's the thing I want you to see. My point is that when people are involved with God, it's not just as receivers. Now let's get into this text. The famine was sore in the land. Can land the Canaan he's talking about. That's a very strong word. Some translations say it's very severe. The famine was severe. They were in bitter need of food. We've never been to anything like this here. It was heavy upon the land. The famine just kept getting worse, 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 worse. It grew worse, New Jerusalem Bible says. It continued to ravage the land of Canaan. What little sprig happened to grow, finally they were killed out. No relief from the terrible famine, Living Bible says. It got worse, contemporary English Bible says. The hunger and destit destitution and starvation were very severe, extremely distressing in the land of Canaan. So are you really surprised that it 
after you're called of God, you, you occupy a time when things are sparse. Does this kind of take you off, Daddy? off Daddy? guard? Daddy? Are, you, are you living kind of an idealistic, with an idealistic view? God only does good. And I don't understand why these things are happening. Do you think about this text we're talking about here. The word translated sore means heavy, great, massive, abundant. In other words, it wasn't just that things quit growing and it lasted for seven years. This thing started out and got worse, worse. And as it progressed, it got more severe. It was harder to find food, harder to survive. Now let's dispense with uh, a bit of false doctrine here. It needs to be thrown in the garbage can. These days, it's become fashionable in Christian service to say that God sends good things, the devil sends bad things, and God never sends bad things. There's a, they'll argue with it with you about this. So some preachers that have low spiritual IQs tell us that storms, tornadoes, floods, famines, these don't come from God. God doesn't do this. Some of them affirm that natural disasters can actually be rebuked by believers. They can go out and command the storm to stop. Make it die out. Or like one, some years ago, there was a cyclone headed for one part of the country. And a TV evangelist prayed it away from their, from their city. And it destroyed a neighboring city. And one person from the neighboring said, he said, I wish you wouldn't have prayed about that storm. <laughs> See, this is all fostered by erroneous views of God. Now, the prophecy with which we're dealing about this famine, God is very uh, specific about it. Seven years, seven years of abundance, seven years of famine and deprivation. Now, interpreting the dreams, here's what Joseph said, Genesis 41, 28. This is the thing which I have spoken unto favor, what God is about to do. Yes, amen. The famine grew worse. This is, this is something God's doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Genesis 41, 32. The thing prophesied is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. So right, there's no question about who did this. Uh, amen. Amen. That's right. But I wouldn't question that God used Satan in some way, but God is the one who did it. Yeah. Elsewhere God has said to send the famine, sometimes just punishment. I'll we'll give you the text there. He has said to bring a famine. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 42 17. He said to call for a famine. 2 Kings 8, 1. Another time God said, I will kill thy root with famine. Isaiah 14, 30. He said he'd punish the disobedient with the famine. Jeremiah eleven twenty two, And consume them with the famine. Jeremiah 14, 12. So this, this is common talk in the Bible. Maybe you think that could never happen in our country. It's the same thing these people thought. Egypt never thought it could happen there either. It was a land of bounty. Canaan was too, flowing with milk and honey. See? You never want to get to the point that you you think God's blessed our land, this will never happen. Well, that's, a, that's not a good way to think. What's the point in bringing this up? That God sends famines and other things like this. The point is men ought to fear the Lord. That's the point. Men ought to be afraid, deathly afraid of offending God. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah once said, Nehemiah 5, 9, Ought ye not to walk in the fear of the Lord because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? See, the enemies are even seeing how bad we are. We better be, that's what he was telling me, we better be waking up here if the enemies see our faults. What do you think God sees? <laughs> he said of the early church, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. 
This is after things like Ananias and Sapphira had happened and so forth. Now the Holy Spirit has moved men to write of the works of God, things he's done. And they're written to acquaint us with God. They're not all what we call good things. He cursed Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. Cain was cursed. A global flood. Cursing of the man, Canaan, Genesis 9, 24. Scattering of the people at Shinar. God did all this. Plaguing of the house of Pharaoh. Cashing out of Hagar and Ishmael. Lot's wife turning to a pillar of salt, closing the wombs of all the women in Abimelech's household, slain Onan and Ur, seven years of famine over Egypt. Just a, it's a lot of other things too, things that God did. Yeah. Now, if this is all you knew, you'd have to be fearful. Say, yeah. I don't want to offend God, but I honestly believe a lot of professing Christians have never had this thought. Woe is to me if I offend God. Even though the Bible is literally filled in every section of the Bible, from Genesis through Revelation, it's filled with God's reaction to people's unbelief and insolence. So this famine was brought on by the Lord. Paul reasoned with the Corinthians who were very sloppy in the way they were living. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? I know some people think this can't be done. I understand this. They don't know what they're talking about, and they should not be dealt with like they did know what they're talking about. These are like ignorant people, and you have to be deal with them as people who don't know anything and instruct them properly in the ways of the Lord. Are we stronger than he? He... <laughs> I hear people glib, they glib, they say this from the pulpit. I've heard this for, I guess, both maybe 50 years. Well, that's not the way I would have done it, but this is how God did I'd be afraid to say that. If that's the way I felt, I wouldn't say it. I'd be afraid God would strike me down right there. Got a controversy with God? God's the one that has a controversy with men. Amen. He says, I have a controversy with the land. What of the person has a controversy disagrees with God? I would think if I was a heavy-handed elder and the preacher got up and said that, he'd be fired on the spot. That'd be it. You got to you got to go, we're going to demote you to this junior, junior church. Teach you some things. The famine increased with intensity. Again, emphasizing this is something God was doing. See, he's preparing the stage now for Israel to come on down in Egypt and be nourished there and grow up and increase there. But for this to happen, all this had to happen. See, he just didn't say, come on down into Egypt. There's a lot of good stuff down here. They couldn't get prepared to receive a Savior by having a lot of good things happen to them. Uh -huh. You see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. They had to know what it's like to suffer and suffer unjustly and walk in a wilderness. and yeah. That's what got them ready yes. for the Savior. Famine increased with intensity until finally... Uh, well, you, you've got to come to the conclusion that man doesn't govern circumstance. And a group of men can't govern circumstance. Circumstances are governed by God. So if God makes the famine worse, there's not a person or an amalgamation of people that can make it better. That's just the way it is. Yes. Because here is the man that, that, that God has so favored, Abraham. And Abraham doesn't even know this is a seven-year famine. That's right. He hadn't even been told this is ever going to end. Yeah. He hadn't been told any of that. So he just has to, you just have to trust the Lord with the circumstances. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had bought, brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go, go again, buy us a little food. So they they used up. Mm -hmm. yes. 
got to get this concept in your mind. You can use up what you get from God. You can use it up. And it came to pass. That phrase is mentioned 453 times in the Bible. And it came to pass. Quite frequently, it, and if not the majority of the time, it introduces either an end or a commencement of something God is doing. And it came to pass. It either commented on the beginning of something or the ending of something, in this case, the progress of it. See, history is really working out of God's purpose. Of course, you've got to know God's purpose and be able to recognize it. Until you do, you accept this as truth. Yes. That God's the governor among the nations, sits on the circle of the earth. He's calling all the shots. There's no place where he doesn't rule. Right. No place you can go to escape his authority and supremacy. But then you've got to get to the point where you can see it. Uh -huh. Amen. You can recognize yes. it. And when certain things happen... Instead of saying, oh, no, Amen. you say, it is the Lord. Yes. Amen. Either he's delivered me or he's teaching me or something of that sort. Yeah. Came to pass when they had eaten up the corn. Now, the idea is that they'd finished them, the, the bins were all gone. They started eating the last of it. They were in the position as a family, like the widow was when God sent the prophet Elijah to a widow to sustain him, and she says, well, we're eating the last bit. Of, we're eating the last bit now. We're on the last portion. We're going to make a meal for me and my son and I. So this is what this means. They had eaten up, meant they were, they had now allocated the last of whatever they were storing it. They got the last barrel full of it. They're eating on it. Now, it's, they didn't wait till they just run out and there wasn't any food at all. This is a long trip, but they didn't, it wasn't an, an, an evening trip. Mm -hmm. yes. So when they got the last portion, they said, this, this is it now. We got to, all right, we got to send, get some more corn. That's where Jacob and his seed were at. There isn't any place else after this. Mm -hmm. Go again and procure us some, get us a little food. Some other versions say a little more food. I mean, they knew they couldn't go down and say, we want, we want a, like a year's supply. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. That's not how it was being distributed. Right. It was being distributed on an as needed. Yeah. It was being distributed on an as needed. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the way grace is distributed. Right. As needed. Uh -huh. You can't like get a warehouse full of grace and store it and then tap into it every once in a while. Now you get as needed. This is the transport a warehouse full anyway. That's right. Well, so our capacity is limited. Yeah. Right? That's why we have to be regularly replenished. Yeah. They could, I suppose, have made several trips, and, uh -huh. but they didn't. It was you're, you're right. It's as needed. This is God's teaching people something here. to know when it's time to go get some more. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Annie? Yeah, and if they had take, <clears throat> taken too much, it would have weighed them down on yeah. their journey back. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. I didn't wait till they run completely out either. Yeah. They had to have some kind of planning yeah. involved. That's right. And, and Amen. His main thing was to stay alive. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Now, that seems simple, but a lot of people don't think this way. Main thing is stay alive. Amen. Whether you're talking in the body or whether you're talking in the spirit. Amen. In the spirit, the main thing is stay alive. Amen. If you got to go someplace else and get supplies, stay alive. Hmm? You have to have you inconvenience yourself, stay alive. Amen. That's the main thing. Sometimes you send somebody else to get supplies and bring them back, too. That's right. Well, that's what Jacob yeah. did. Uh -huh. Go again. Get a little. <laughs> Now, this is in the Hebrew text, but it's omitted in several versions. I listed them, they, they don't say little. But it is, it is in the versions, and it means fewness or little or small. I mean, they knew that Joseph wasn't going to have them send a train of semi-camels or something and 
That's not how he was distributed, and that isn't how God has distributed it either. Of course, a, a little grain was from one point, it was, if you like it of a day, it was a lot. So this was, corn was distributed on a ration basis. It was rationed out. Now there's some spiritual principles to uh, be seen here. There's a sense in which spiritually you can't store a lot. You probably maybe have learned this already by, by experience. Precious gems of truth, if they're not used, you forget them. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And sometimes you, you kind of wake up and you, yeah. well, you weren't, you weren't using them, so they just disappeared yeah. from your memory. In the hour of crisis or deep need, such a person will forget when they're tried. Mm -hmm. They've neglected what they've been given, see? Mm -hmm. Now comes this inevitable testing, this yeah. trial. Uh -huh. God gave them supplies that would have, that would have, Address that situation and would have carried them through it, but they didn't. Yeah. Remember, so they had other things they were doing, yes. other things more important. They brushed it aside, and now they don't have anything mm -hmm. in the hour of crisis. Okay. Yes. Point sometimes things that aren't, <laughs> things that are used a lot, they get worn down, like in a motor, the moving parts of it <clears throat> are the parts that most quickly get worn down and rusted and they have to be replaced. But in this case, the more the things are used, the more they are sharpened. And the more you're able to make applications in scriptures with these things because mm -hmm. you're used them more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Many, many professing believers live in spiritual impoverishment almost all the time, unable to tap into the vast resources that are available. Why is that so? Because they've never really presented their body, this flesh and blood body, they have never presented it to God a living sacrifice. Amen. Well, untold Christians have never done this, brethren. They've never done this, not to this day. Mm -hmm. Some of them been there supposedly in Christ for years. They never have done this. Presented their bodies, their, their reason for living was God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not why some people live that are Christians. Yeah. They live for their families or for success or for some lower motive that of itself is not necessarily wrong, but it's, it's wrong as a primary primary motive. The result of this misdirection is they can't access what they know in their intellect. Your intellect will not support you. Your heart will. Yes. Amen. So your intellect can have a lot of stuff in it that can't get down to your heart because it hasn't been used. You may have been subjected to a lot of truth but you didn't use it so it stayed up there in your mind, if we could say it that way. But it never really got into the working part. It never got into the kitchen. Yeah. Amen. Your heart's like the kitchen mm -hmm. where the stuff is processed. Yeah. And some people, they, how do you say it? They don't have enough fellowship or exposure to the truth for things to get into their heart. Yeah. It just it just gets to their head, and that's that's all. I don't use my sharpest chisels to open up cans. I just don't do that. I mean, that would be like a foolish thing. But somebody that didn't know any different, yeah. it's something sharp. You might as well use it. But see, until you understand the truth, you'll never be able to that's use right. it right. And then you, this comes along with it. You do not get more until you use what you've got. In Christ, learning is like building an edifice. As you proceed upward, like, like a building, you build it from the bottom up. 
You don't build a building from the top down. Someone, Manning Matthew or someone, just commented on it. You don't build from the top down. You build from the bottom up. And until and as you're building this edifice, you're using the materials you got going going upward. But if you don't use these materials, the building is going to stop, and you'll get used to living in the basement. Yeah. Uh -huh. I've known people who started building a house, and they they're a bit too ambitious. You were thinking they'd have enough to build a nice big house, but they they didn't have enough. So as a result, they lived for a long time in the basement. <clears throat> for a long time, that was their dwelling. This is I'm talking about actual incidents. Uh -huh. They lived in the basement for a long time because they just didn't realize how few materials they had. And there are some people trying to construct their life. They're, they're building their life like they got a lot of materials, and they don't. They haven't invested their time and resources and their minds and their hearts. They haven't invested them in the Lord, but they have these great ambitions to do this and do that for God, but they don't have enough materials. Yeah. Yes, Sister Nick. We have this um, picture of a cow chewing a cud. You can only get so much <laughs> nutrition the first time around. You've got to continue chewing that's on that, right. and mm -hmm. that's where that meditation comes that's in. Right. You get some, you get something out of it the first time around, but then you got to keep chewing on it in order yeah. for it to mm -hmm. really open up. Amen. Amen. And the Lord's the one that opens it up to you. That's good. Excellent. That is med picture of meditation. Yes. So they run out of food. Jacob says, get a little more. And Judah spake unto him, he speaks up, the man, that's Joseph, they don't know it's Joseph, the man did solemnly protest to us, saying, ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou, wilt send you, if thou Jacob, will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food, that buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. Are you aware of how many situations would be resolved in life if people who knew it was pointless to do something said, We're not going to do it? Right. Do you realize how many things would be solved if people just say that? We're not going to do it. We know that that's not going to work. I don't care if you are my mother or my father. We're not going to do it. Yes. No, I don't care if you are the elder or the uh -huh. big hoppity hop in the church. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. See, this is all involved in spiritual life. Jacob had said earlier that he would not sin. That was the last word Jacob, Jacob had said on this matter. I would, Benjamin is not going with you. That was a statement he made. But Judah, he he pressed this matter. He, he didn't say, no need to say anything, brothers. Dad already said he's not going to. So I guess we just get ready to die of starvation here in Canaan. This isn't the way he thought. So I'm going to bring this up again. I'm going to make another appeal to Jacob. He solemnly protested, Judas said. He made him have so solemnly warned us. He did it with an oath. He was absolutely serious. This wasn't just like a hasty word that this ruler said. Now, by these words, he solemnly protested. Judah meant the following. There was no question about the ruler's intention. This was not oratory. They were intended to be, a, they were obvious determination that this ruler had made. Couldn't be talked out of it. There was not the slightest suggestion that he would not do precisely what he said. You'll die. This would mean that they would all die and then Jacob would be left only with Benjamin at home. Yeah, yeah. So that's the alternative, Dad. Mm -hmm. Now you said you send our brother with us. We'll go down. We'll go down. 
He leaves Jacob no alternative. Now, we're not, if you won't, we're not going. If you do, we're on the way. Now, these are mature men. These are not like teenagers. <laughs> these are mature grown men, 40s or 50s, maybe as high as 60. These are, these are men of age. So children being subject to their parents, this doesn't enter into this. This doesn't have anything to do with this text. Judah knows the circumstance that it will be pointless to go to Egypt to buy corn if the demands the ruler isn't met. So he tells what the ruler said, and he says there, we're not going to go. Without being accompanied by Benjamin, the ruler wouldn't even talk to him. Not only will we, we not be able to buy corn, he's the only one we can get it from. He won't even come out to meet with us. That's how determined this is. Now, there's a lesson that can be learned in this incident. Joseph, in this case, is a type of the Lord distributing food and resources to his people. And when coming to him for spiritual goods, there are certain requirements that he's laid out. I want to just name some of them, because this is exactly how the Lord operates. Come out from among them. All right, if you appear at his presence to buy supplies and you haven't done that, you won't get any. That's right. Make no mistake about right. this. This means that you just won't. Uh -huh. Be ye separate. Mm -hmm. All right, you think, you're, you think your God's going to give you more grace if you don't do what he said? Yeah. Touch not the unclean thing. But there you are, you're dabbling with it. Now the time comes, you need something from God. I'll be right up front with you. You're not going to get it until you do what he said. Amen. Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness of the fear of the Lord. But person doesn't do this. They had all kind of unclean habits are clinging on to them. Now they come to a point, I need the Lord. I'm going to go to the Lord. The Lord just won't answer the door. This is the way it is, our brother. It sounds hard, but this is the way it is. He said, draw near with a true heart. Don't be coming because it's just an emergency. Come to me because you prefer me and you want me. Draw nigh in full assurance of faith. Don't come to me saying, I hope I, I, hope I can get it. I, I'm not sure that I can. Don't, don't let that man think he's going to receive anything from God, James Amen. said. Person who doubts. So he shouldn't even think he's going to get anything from God because he's not. Draw near having your heart sprinkled of an evil conscience. Settle, this, settle your past. Get it settled. If there's things in your past that are gnawing at you, get it settled before you come for more grace. Draw near having your bodies washed with pure water. I understand that to be an allusion to baptism. If you haven't done that, don't don't go any further till you get that done. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Draw near with by a better hope. Mm -hmm. It's your hope that draws you there. Ask in faith, nothing wavering, coming without doubt. See, those are all things and much more that God requires. Yeah. Yeah. If He's going to distribute to you, He's got to be speaking as a man. He's got to be confident you're serious, and the only way He is is whether you've done what He said. If you haven't, you're not even serious. Yeah, that's right. Yes. He gives you. He says, "Do this. You do this, and then you get more, and, and, yeah. and your confidence your grows, your right. hope grows, your strength. Right. But as you don't do these things, <coughs> you get weaker and weaker. That's right. And then you're not able. It seems simple when you talk about it, yeah. but somehow, when it comes down to the practicality of this, this has eluded professing Christians. Yes. They, they can't see this. Some people who can, who can go to the Lord and get nothing. There are people like this. And they mean to get something when they go. They mean to get something. But they don't. Maybe it's in some form of some answered prayer. They got some dilemma. It's a vexing dilemma. They pray. They ask God to take away and nothing happens. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean the person hasn't done what they should do, but it could mean that. A person has to examine himself, see if they're in the faith. 
So it's necessary to pay attention to what God requires. Mm -hmm. And he said a lot about it now. No apostle ever spoke to a group of people or a person without telling them what God expected. Mm-hmm. Remember Peter, before he baptized the people, before he baptized the people, or they, before they were baptized, he said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now that's not in any step of salvation that I, steps of salvation plan that I've ever seen. And yet that was said mm-hmm. before the people were baptized. Yeah. Because immediately after that, as many as gladly received the word were baptized. Mm-hmm. Save yourself. Have you ever heard any, Have you ever say, heard that said from a pulpit? No. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. This generation is headed the wrong direction. Uh-huh. Save yourself from it. Uh-huh. But that was said before the people were baptized. Mm-hmm. And the people gladly received it. We're, we're separating from this road we're on. We're getting off right here. Now, Jacob, he protests, and in the flesh, this is how you'd reason. He said, uh, why did you tell him you had a brother? What, what, why did you do I can understand in the flesh this is what I'd have done. Too. I'd have done what, why didn't you keep that secret? What did, what did you tell him you had a brother at home before? <laughs> other person said why did you deal so wrongfully with me like this I'll just, you stacked things against me yeah. went and told him you had a brother I, why did you do that yeah, by nature the independent of the new creation this is how flesh thinks don't tell him don't tell him what you have they might take it from you one sense is a tone of exasperation in Joseph it's like an exasperation <laughs> Why did you tell a man you had another brother? Well, Judah speaks right up. He says, well, he asked us. He asked us. He straightly asked us of our state and of our kindred, saying, is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words. This is... Now, if you go back to the record, there's no record before this of them, him saying this. So some people think, well, they cooked this up, see? But they didn't cook it up because later Mm -hmm. Judah says to Joseph, Mm -hmm. Genesis 42, 13, Thy brothers are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is this day with our father. In verse chapter 44, that's... The, the record of the what Jacob is re, Jews referring to is he didn't he didn't tell him in that text Joseph didn't ask these questions but in the forty fourth chapter verse nineteen through twenty four Judah spoke privately to Joseph and here's what he said My Lord asked his servants saying Have ye a father or a brother and we said unto my Lord We have a father, an old man, a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother's dead, and he alone is left of his his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we, we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father should die. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it shall come to pass, and... We came up unto thy servant, my father. We told him the words of my Lord. So this is what uh Joseph said. You see why you have to know the whole of Scripture? And you can't just pick up or draw conclusions on a basis of your immediate exposure to the text. So Judah told the truth. That is what was said. They had not conducted themselves thoughtlessly. At the beginning, Judah spelled it out. To who he said it was a ruler, he told him a good, good case. He pled. He's the only one left of his, well, of his wife, and he loves him a lot, and he's going to break his heart. So he pled with him, see, told him the case. Judah, after he told his father, he said, Send the lad with me. We will rise and go that we may live. Send the lad with me. 
when my judgment language that Benjamin was a young boy. It's in the lead. And you see pictures of this as a little kid. You know, it's a little kid. Hebrew word translated lad has a wide range of meaning from child and infant all the way up to adult. I'm going to tell you first what some commentators have said about this. Pulpit commentary says, though styled a lad, he must have been at this time upwards of 20 years old. John Gill says he must have been 32 years of age, for he was seven years younger than Joseph, who is now 39 of age. Benjamin must have had, must have children of his own. Keel and Dietrich, Dietrich says Benjamin is 23 years old. Matthew Henry says Benjamin was at this time at least 24 years of age. Some think 30 and a, had a family of his own. Now, why I'm saying this is when. When translators translate scripture, they've got to have a grasp of scripture itself, because scripture answers this question a little later. In fact, at the time, which was shortly after this, that Jacob went down into Egypt, remember he took everybody and went down into Egypt, which is shortly after this. At that time, Benjamin had 10 boys. And they're listed in Genesis 46, 21. These are the ones that came down into Egypt. So I mention this because Benjamin wasn't a little boy. Mm -hmm. He was a mature, mature man. Possibly all ten of these sons existed at this time. So it kind of puts a little slant on when you say young man. Mm -hmm. means you're not matured fully as a man. So they're pleading for this father of ten. They're pleading. <laughs> Quite a picture. Now you, you, you send him with us that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little ones. That will die of starvation is the idea. If we don't go down there, Father, we're going to die of starvation here. And then you're not only going to have, all your sons are going to die. And all of their sons are going to die. Yeah. Children are going to die. So send them with us that we may live. Mm -hmm. Not speaking of death and that Joseph inflicted the death. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about they died before they ever went back. Mm -hmm. I will be surety for him. This is the first time this word is used in this sense in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Surety. Mm -hmm. A word surety is found in the Bible elsewhere like of a surety, mm -hmm. that in that sense is used several times, but it's a different Hebrew word. This word, as used here, surety or pledge or guarantee, this is the first time it's used in Scripture. And it's a foreshadowing Christ who is declared to be a surety of a better covenant. Amen. See, mm -hmm. In saying he'd be a surety for Benjamin, Judah was saying that he would be the personal guarantor of the safety of Benjamin. I will guarantee his safety. Now this type is fulfilled in Christ, and it's a glorious thing to, to, to see. As a surety that Christ is responsible for the ones being saved. Amen. God's turned them over to him. Yes. Bring them home. Amen. Bring them to glory. Jesus has made a surety of a better testament, Hebrews 7, 20 through 22. The Amplified Bible reads, It was not without taking an oath that Christ was made priest. For those who formerly became priests received their office without, it being, without its being confirmed by the taking of an oath by God. But this one was designated and addressed and saluted with an oath. The Lord had sworn and will not regret it to, or change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In keeping with the oath's greater strength and force, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better, stronger agreement, a more excellent and more advantageous covenant. Everything you receive from God is because of Jesus. And it's applicable to you only if you abide 
in Jesus. This is how the new covenant works. See, this is how the new covenant works. The old covenant wasn't like this. It wasn't because of your connection with Moses. It was you were on your own. You have to do everything I said. But here, this doesn't mean you don't do what God said. It means your primary focus is abide in Christ. You've been called into the fellowship of God's dear Son, 1 Corinthians 1, nine. You can't let that deteriorate. You've got to maintain it. Whatever interferes with that, drop it out of your life. However necessary it may seem, drop it out of your life. You're the one that's got to make the decision on this. No, no one else can make this decision for you. But I can tell you from personal experience, there's certain things that of themselves were not wrong that I had to disengage. Uh -huh. I'm sure this applies to everyone. Why? Why? Because they interfered with me holding on to Christ and not holding on to Christ exempted me from the benefits. You've got to see that. If, you're, if your fellowship with Christ is not maintained, you get zero. Amen. You're just like the boys coming back to Joseph without their brother. He's not going, he doesn't go out to meet you. That's no wonder Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I command you? This is how the kingdom kingdom operates. When we are drawn, it's because of Christ. We're drawn to Christ by God. Amen. When we're forgiven, it's for Christ's sake. The law of God is written upon our heart and put into our mind because of him. He's the one. See, he's a surety. He's the one that makes all this happen. When we're kept by the power of God, it's because of him. The new covenant has actually been made with Christ. The new covenant isn't made with you. Mm -hmm. That's right. The promise was I'll make it with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, but that was embodied in Christ. Mm -hmm. Thus it is written, Galatians 3.16, Now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he saith, Not and to seeds, but as of many, but as of one, to thy seed. Mm -hmm. See, the covenant promises were the covenant was made with Abraham and Christ. Christ himself, in fact, has been given as a covenant. Isaiah 42, 6. The Lord, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy right hand and will keep thee and will give thee for a covenant of the people. Whoever has Christ has the covenant. Amen. Whoever doesn't have Christ doesn't have the covenant. See, the sinner is out of Christ. The new birth puts you into Christ. And that's where the surety <laughs> where the surety is. Beautiful picture. In the case of God's favorable all the favorable dealings with the people by God is because of Christ. Technically speaking, in salvation, the status of a person with God does not depend on what they do. Technically speaking. Depends on whether or not it is done in Christ. Mm -hmm. The concentration of effort, therefore, has to be mm -hmm. on abiding in Him. Oh, Amen. Amen. And Judah continues. He said, "Now we, except we had lingered, mm -hmm. what he calls this, however long this discussion took, he referred to it as being as lingering. If we not lingered. And now we return to say we'd already been back here with." Simeon and Benjamin and, and the grain. We'd, we'd made the trip. Come back already. Yeah. See, unbelief causes delay. Mm. Yes. Amen. For a while, That's Jacob right. didn't believe this. Uh -huh. yeah. And his, his reasoning was flawed because he thought Joseph was dead. Yeah. So, uh -huh. see, there was a component of his thinking that was not That's right. right. Yeah. Even though he didn't, uh, didn't know it at the time. And I feel that, uh, personally, that the majority of spiritual retardation or slowness of people to respond to the Spirit, it is delivered by various members of the body of Christ, is because they have, they have lingered. 
They've not moved on what they know they should do. Yeah. They know God said certain things, but they're delaying. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the word passes them by. Mm -hmm. And the resources do too. When it says, uh, we linger, you say, see, you've got to act immediately. There's a certain immediacy that's required. If Jesus says, take up your bed and walk, yeah. you don't go home and pray about it. No. You pick it up and yeah. start walking. Right. Yeah. Amen. Everybody can see that, can't you? Yes. As, soon as, you, as soon as it comes home to you, what is required, you, yeah. at that point, you do it on an immediate yeah. basis. But too, just like right. whenever Isaac was gonna, I mean, whenever um, Abraham was gonna sacrifice Isaac. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Now, retardation hmm. leads to spiritual dissipation. That's right. The longer you wait, everything's like leaking out, like out of a bag with holes in it. As you're lingering, your resources are dwindling. That's right. Dwindling away. If we were just in this without an enemy, you know, the, the lingering may be able to last longer. But we have an enemy that as soon as you begin to yes, linger, right. they start poking holes in yes, your bag. Right. Yeah. Now those who have, uh, who have lost a lot of resources and still try and soar into the heavenlies, if, you, if you've got to imagine this now, a 747 is a big airplane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, big as a house, big. You can imagine if somebody said, look, we've got a number of citizens that are afraid to fly high. So we'd like you to build a 747 that can fly long distances 20 feet off the ground. There are some people trying to do this. They're trying to fly to glory like trying to fly a jet 20 feet off the ground. It's not made. It's made for high flights. The bigger the plane, the higher it's got to go. You can see that, can't you? There are a lot of people, they don't have enough stuff to get up in the heavenly places, but they're still trying to do what God told them to do. And they can't do it because they don't have the resources to do it, and they don't have the resources because they've been waiting too long. They've been lingering, procrastinating. Well, finally, Jacob yields. Their father Israel said unto them, If it be so now... Do this. Take of the best fruits of the land in your vessels. Carry down the man a present, a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. Take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again in your hand. Peradventure there was an oversight. Maybe this all was a mistake, that money being returned. Although it doesn't look like it, Jacob really doesn't want to do this. But it's circum he's, he sees it's got to be done. Do it because it's necessary. See, there are some things you have to do it because it's necessary. You, you may not really have an anxious desire to do it, but it's something that's got to be done. It may hurt to you do it. In our time, there, there are a lot of belated... Uh, responses to the things of God. And the less you are exposed to the things of God, the more delay there is. So here's a, here's the decision that's been made by the religious experts. Here's the decision that's been made. Shrink the services down. Cut down the length, cut down the quantity, cut down the frequency. All right, now this means you've, re you've restricted the intake. And you've made it impossible for people to sustain a spiritual status. That's what these men have done. And they'll be judged for doing it now. They're the blind leading the blind. And they're going to fall into the ditch. Now, let's, let's do this. And he tells them, now, I want you to take a present to the governor. I want you to take some balm. A little bit of honey, some spices, some nuts, some almonds. 
You say, wait a minute. We got a famine here. How do, how do we have this? All of these items could be stored. Yeah. See, they, they, were, they could be made, a st storehouse of them could be maintained. But here's something you got to pick up on. These could be kept, but they could not sustain life. You had to have grain to sustain the life. You couldn't sustain life with balm, honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. You couldn't keep the folk alive on that diet. Now, now I want to make a spiritual parallel here. Spiritually speaking, there are things that fall in the category of balm, honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. They're good. They, they have some degree of nourishment, nourishing value, but you can't live by them. Now I'm going to name some things that folk can, that are like these. These are spiritual balm, honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. There's our association with God. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice to God, submitting your members to God, walking as dear children. See, a, this is legitimate now, but it's like it's like bomb. And it's our, our association with the people of God. The scripture has something to say with this, loving the brethren, edifying the people of God, preferring one another, provoking one another to love and good works. There's domestic association. Husbands love your wives, wives obey your husbands, children obey your parents, fathers raise your children, nurse them next to the Lord. This is like almonds, see? This is like almonds. Yeah. It's good, but it can't sustain you. Yeah. It's our posture toward those two that are in the world. Know how to answer every man, do things that are approved of men, doing all doing good to all men, praying for all men. So, so these are things that have to do with our posture toward the world and what scriptures speak about. There's our responsibility to government, honor the king, be subject to higher powers, pay tribute. But if you emphasize these things or all of these things, the people will die. Just as surely as Jacob and his sons would have died, if this is all they ate, they'd have died from the famine. There are ministries, there are in, people, their entire ministry is one of these areas I just mentioned. You cannot sustain spiritual life with this. That doesn't mean you neglect it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this can't be the main diet. This to me was a kind of a revelation. I, <laughs> I hope you could you could see it. But there's a tremendous amount of emphasis on just the God and country people. You know, wave the flag and you know, everything. This is their emphasis. We're not we're not like saying this is all wrong stuff. That's not what we're saying. We're saying this is a wrong emphasis. You got it when you take your sacks down to Egypt. You don't. You're not going down to get a sack of almonds. Got to have the grain. We got to have the real nourishing stuff, and eat these other things on the side, <coughs> kind of to uh, uh, complement our diet. So should a person choose to place the emphasis of teaching on these things, their souls will begin to wither. And if you know people that have done this, and you probably won't have to go far to find people who have, and maybe you were once in the category yourself. You will know that without exception, people like this are shallow. I challenge you to find one that isn't, yet is emphasizing these things. So whether we're speaking of historical teachers or contemporary ones, those whose teaching places stress on the duty of men, whether it's toward God or one another or government or family, it just does not sustain the soul. Now, Jacob says, take double money. There's a tremendous amount of disagreement. I think we touched on this before. Some people say this meant take money for the corn plus the money you return from the bag, and that's, that's twice. But I go with the people that say that you take twice as much money to buy. 
during the time of famine, I think Joseph thought the price could very well be going up. Yeah. Or maybe we need a little bigger supply. We ran out in a month. Maybe we need to get a little bit more. So take twice as much money in your hand, plus you return the money that's in the bag. Now, there's three different views of this taken in the translations and by the commentators. Double means your your new purchase money plus the money in that was returned in the bag. The second view is there's twice as much money for the purchase of the new plus the money in the bag. And the other is twice, take the new purchase money plus twice as much as was in the bag. And that's the view of the Message Bible written by Eugene Peterson. That's the view he takes. I take this view that was twice twice the money they took before they took twice that much plus they returned the money. And Jacob says, peradventure, that is, I'm not sure how this will turn out, but it might be that this was a a mistake. Actually, it was done on purpose, but he said it might have been a mistake, and if if we posture ourselves right, they'll know we, we're not trying to take advantage of an error. See? Yeah. Yeah. See? Amen. See? Some people say it was a mistake, but I got, whoo, I got some extra money here because of the I gave him ten. I gave him a dollar, and he gave me change for a ten. Woo, boy! But it was a mistake. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, flesh tries to capitalize on mistakes. Then he makes a statement that for a person in Christ is not that big of a statement, but for these times it was. He says, "Go again to the man now, and God Almighty, God Almighty, God Almighty." That's uh, Shaddai. El Shaddai. El means God. Shaddai means Almighty. El Shaddai means God Almighty. There was a song written named El Shaddai. Yeah. Now it's difficult for men to comprehend a being that has all power. That's a hard concept for men to accept. Men to think of transcendent power. So when God speaks of God Almighty, He's not speaking of from the standpoint of human experience. This is from the standpoint of revelation, God Almighty. In fact, God appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. He appeared to Jacob, told him, I'm, I'm God Almighty. God said that to Abraham too, I'm, I'm God Almighty. That means there is no might, power, aptitude, ability that doesn't come from him. Amen. Counting Satan's power which means he can take it back. Yes. God doesn't take back what didn't come from him. What didn't come from him, he just destroys it. Mm 